two samples versus the raw data is that if you're canceling out any error, so if you've got raw data, you will have a measurement error. If I take the average of two consecutive data points and monitor those averages, I'm going to get less variability in my monitoring chart. If I take 10 samples and average them, I'm going to get even less variability still. So I'm taking the average of 10 data points. Okay, I'm going to get a very smooth monitoring chart, but what's going to happen if there's a problem in my process? It's going to take up to 10 samples for you to start to see that problem. So the larger you make your subgroup size, the app, you get a smoother looking curve. <coughs> you get a more reliable signal, but it's going to take you longer to throw up an alarm that says, hang on, something is wrong. Okay, so it's very much a trade-off between how fast you want to be able to flag something and how smooth you want the plot to appear. Okay, so if, let's take my raw data. If my raw data looked something like this, I had, I had here's my, my process operating, and my raw data is over here, 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 then I have a data point up there, for example, and then that down here. If I use subgroups of size 2, the average of those two points is going to be that square over there. The average of these two points is going to be a point up here. And the average of these two points is going to be up here. Okay, so my monitoring chart is going to look something like that, and then come down. If I use subgroups of size 5, <coughs> Now I'm taking five data points, one, two, three, four, five. My average is going to be somewhere over right here of those five. And then I take my next five and the average is going to be down here. So I'm not going to get as much variability in this monitoring chart with the larger subgroup size. I'm, not, I'm going to get smoother looking trends that are close to my target. The smaller my subgroup, I'm going to, really I'm just tracking the noise and variability in my raw data. So we like larger subgroups, but we recognize there's a trade-off. The longer, my, my, or the bigger my subgroup, the longer it's going to take to actually catch a problem on my process. So these are typical subgroup sizes, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, you can obviously go larger than that, but that's, those, are, those are reasonable values. And we ended off last class by showing how that lower control limit and upper control limit were computed. We compute our subgroups, averages, x bar k, and we use the average of those averages as my target. Or I can simply go to my, my uh, specifications for the process and say, what should my target be, and use that as, the, as my center line. But to find the upper and lower control limits, we work around that center point on x double bar, and we go down by three standard deviations, and we go up by three standard deviations. I noticed that the average of the average is always equal to the average. The average of your data that you've collected is. That's, that's right. Okay. So you, there's a number of ways of, of specifying that. You can use the median, you can use the average of the averages, the average of all the data. Right? So finding the target is the easy part. The, the, the harder part is to find what those upper and lower control limits are. And they, those are always set to be a certain number of standard deviations above and below the targets. So here's an example then where you take these raw data points, um, and we can compute x bar from them. So here's five, five values of these subgrouping of five. x bar one is 237, I can put that in deviation. I can then plug that into my formula. I take my next subgroup size, plug that x bar and s, and, and, and go, go through that procedure. Here's, for, for this given data set, I've calculated x double bar and I've calculated s bar and you can go and compute the upper and lower control limits. So that's what the next slide shows. Let's just go there. The next slide shows, take your x double bar, go down three standard deviations, go up three standard deviations. That's the 9.28. The 0.94 is that AN correction term, and root 5 is the root 5 of something. So that gives me upper and lower control limits of 2.5 and 2. But if I go back to my, my raw my, my data, I'll see that there is one of the subgroups, 253, that exceeds the control limit. So 253 exceeds this value of 252. Here it's shown up here visually. Let's just go back to the raw data and see where that comes from. So over here, there must be a value 253. 
Remember, this vector shown over here is my x bars. These are my averages already calculated. So this 245 is the average of five values. That 239 is the average of five values. So I've calculated up and lower control limits, and one of the x bars that I've used in my calculation actually exceeds the control limits. So what we say is, well, this data point has probably biased that control limit to the slightly. In this case, it's just beyond it, so it's not going to be a big bias. But what if that point was over here? Then that broad that data point has pulled the up control limit wider than it really needs to be. So the, the next step is calculate your control limits, then go back to your subgroups and check that all of them lie within the control limits. If you find any of them lying outside the limits, you exclude that subgroup and you recalculate your lower and upper control limits. Okay, so this process is often iterative. You may have to do this two or three times. You go through your raw data, calculate lower control limits and upper control limits. Check if any subgroups lie outside, exclude any that do, and recompute the lower control and upper control limits. Check again, exclude. Check again, exclude. I usually find that it's about three or four iterations before you get control limits that contain all your data. So that's that's the that's the standard approach. And in the next assignment, uh, you will you will have an actual data set from a company and get a chance to calculate those control limits. Now, that being said, let's take a look at how we judge what our control limits are and how effective they are. We'll talk about some terminology that you must be familiar with. It's called type one and type two error. Who's heard of type one error and type two error? Who's heard of the term false positive? A doctor or a nurse or a practitioner makes a false positive or a false negative. You've heard that terminology before. Let's talk about what that means here in this context. So if I've got a control chart and I'm monitoring my process, I'm plotting x bar values. So I'm going to raise this over here. Everyone's got this down. Let me show the control chart. right now that everything on my process actually is well behaved. So I am in control. And I'm plotting x bar. That's x bar at a certain time, and then I plot x bar at another time, x bar at the next time point, and then I get an x bar down here. So I'm outside my control limit. But let's say we know the truth. For some reason we know the truth on our process, and we know we're actually operating just, just fine. However, I record a data point outside that limit. That's called a type 1 error. So my process is in control, but this data point x bar falls outside the limits. These limits are statistical limits. There's a certain probability that we will see this even with good operating data. And that's what's easily computed. You can calculate that limit that you've got a chance of 1 in 370 of that happening if you're using plus and minus three standard deviation limits. So we call that alpha, and in this case, alpha is equal to 0.0027. That's the probability of seeing that sort of event occur. It's one in 370. It's called a false positive, it's called a false alarm. Because you're telling your operators, go and investigate this problem when it doesn't really exist. So it's a false alarm. If you were testing for diseases in a, in a drug, in a laboratory, you take a blood sample and you may be checking for a blood-borne disease and you tell the person, you know what, you have disease something or other, but they really don't. You've created a false alarm. Okay, it's a false positive. You've made the person think that they have the disease when in fact they don't. Or if, if I was monitoring my process, I reject that product that I produced. So I produce this batch of material, and I say, well, it's outside the limits. I throw that batch of material away, because I'm not prepared to ship it to my customers. It's called
called the producer's risk. Me as the producer, I've thrown that away. Let's take the next case, a type two error. So a type two error occurs in the opposite way. So here, let's say we were in control. <coughs> and now let's say we're out of control. So my process really is operating abnormally. <coughs> in this instance on the right hand side. So an out of control observation is an observation that's inside the control limits, even though my process is operating at normal. Okay, so when we're out of control, we want to see our points lying outside the limits because we're at normal. But if my point falls inside the limits at that instance, I'm saying I've made a type two error. So X bar is not stable, but falls within the limits. This is called beta. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about beta, but it's called a false negative. So it's when you take that blood test and you tell the person, you know what, you're all clear, go home, and you've got nothing to worry about. But that person has HIV or TB or some disease, and you told them, don't worry about it, you're all clear, and you're fine. Okay, so that, there you've made a false negative. This is the case where if I ship this product to my customer, they use it and it messes up their processes or it, just, it creates some negative outcome for them or it, this product is totally unacceptable for them to use. So it's called the consumer's use. The consumer's accepted that product that you thought is in control but is not real. So those are the type one and type two errors. And it's very, very apparent from this discussion is that it's asymmetric. This risk is not evenly distributed. Okay. So, Clearly the example of diagnosing someone whether they have a disease. Which is more preferable? To be told you have HIV when you don't, or to be told you don't have HIV when you do? So it's very much an asymmetrical risk. Which is more preferable? To send someone to jail for 10 years because they're innocent, or to let them go free even though they're guilty? Which is preferable? put a passenger on a plane thinking they're not carrying some form of weapon, or do you kick them off the plane even though they're not carrying a weapon? So airport screening is very much an asymmetrical risk. Screening and process monitoring, same thing. Which would you prefer, to have false alarms and making your operators go and investigate them, or to ship products to your customers when when it's, when it's a really bad product. Okay. There's no right answer here. The only thing we do know is that you can't have both. You cannot have low type 1 error and low type 2 error. Here's why. Let's take a look at this process. It's in control. I'm telling my operators to go investigate that point. My operators come back to me and say, you know what, you just wasted four hours of my day. I went to go troubleshoot the process when I saw this and nothing, nothing was wrong. You just wasted my time. So, okay, let's go put that control in it here so it doesn't happen again. So I've just gone and made my control in it wide. Was that a sensible strategy? What's happened to my type 2 error? My type 2 error is the probability that the process is not stable, but my data point still falls within the limits. My type 2 error has gone up. And so I've, I've, I've decreased my type 1 error by making these limits wider, but my type 2 error has gone up. You can never have both maximized. You trade one more versus the other. Never ever can you get both, both low. So let's uh, let's take a look a bit at type two error, just understand it visually as well. So here's my process, the black line, and the lower control limits and the upper control limits, the vertical lines. So that's the usual, the usual derivation. 
Now what's going to happen is let's assume my underlying process has shifted in some way. And it's shifted so that it now follows the dashed red distribution. My process has shifted upwards. I should be operating at a target of six. It's moved up by what we'll call delta times sigma. Sigma is the standard deviation of the, the process originally, so whatever that standard deviation was, and it's shifted up by delta multiples of sigma. So delta could be one, two, point seven, some multiple of sigma is shifted along. What's the probability that a new x bar from this pro from this shifted process will fall within the existing limits? So what's the probability that a new data point will fall within my existing limits? So what's the probability of making a type two error? As shown in the answer, it's one minus the shading area. So my new process is going to follow this red distribution. I'm going to get some portion of my new observations falling outside my control limits and correctly flagging that my process has shifted. But still, the vast majority of my data points from the shifted process are actually going to still fall within my, my control limits that I have from before. So beta then, the probability of making a type 2 error has increased, I'm oh, sorry, has decreased, but it's still, there's still a sizable fraction here. I'm still going to have a substantial amount of my process uh, showing that nothing has gone wrong. We're still within the control limits. Now what this should start to bother you is recognize that the Schumann chart that we've spent uh, deriving the control limits for, the up and low control limits for, the intention of a Schumann chart is to track whether you're on target or not. Okay, so here's my target six. That's the intention of the Schuart chart, is to make sure that I'm at six or within a certain tolerance. Here I've gone and shown my process shifted fairly substantially. It shifted almost by, if this is one, two, three sigma, it shifted by about two sigma here. But I'm still getting a substantial amount of my, my samples lying within the upper level control limits. What this should indicate to you is that a Schuart chart, even though it's designed to track that you're on target, does not do a very good job of this. The Schumann chart will successfully flag if this red shift was dramatic, like if I had gone from a 6 to a 10. Absolutely, then the majority of my signal would show outside the line. But small shifts in your process, very small adjustments, will not get flagged by a Schumann chart. A Schumann chart is incredibly sluggish at picking up small shifts. And we won't go through the details, this slide here is very much for 600 level students, but it shows how you can compute what that probability is of, of not raising your alarm based on by how much the process has shifted. The key thing that you have to get out of this though is that the Schuart chart is not good at detecting small changes in location. So we're going to look at some other approaches on how you can improve that. The first approach to recognize is that your control limits are not set. You calculate up and low control limits from the procedure we showed earlier, but you don't have to implement those. You can absolutely, and you would not be making a mistake doing this, you can absolutely go to your process and simply move that limit down or up as you require. If this limit that you calculated is not working out for you, go move it down. But you're obviously going to be aware of how you're trading off the type 1 and type 2 error. Okay, so simply move that. It's, it's not incorrect. You don't have to follow the textbook limits. Many companies don't do this. They simply follow the textbook rules. They get limits. The limits create a whole lot of false alarms, cause operators to run around, and they say, oh, the control chart is garbage. The statistics are not working out for me. Well, no. The upper and lower control limits are initial guides. Simply go move those limits wider or narrower as you need to get the type of detection level that you want. But you're going to recognize you can't have the best of both. You cannot have low type 1 and low type 2. You can have one or the other. The other thing you can go do on a control chart is to try and track small shifts is the following. These are called Western electric rules. 
And these are additional rules that you go and apply to your, to your process. These rules say, well, my, my normal rule is if I'm outside the limits, I flag that an, an error has occurred, and I go and investigate. But the Western Electric Rule says, well, hang on, if my process has shifted, and let's assume my original process was, was here, so this is the Instagram for my original process, sent it at the target. Let's assume that at this point in time, my process goes and shifts so that the histogram moves down. So what's going to happen is my process has shifted, so it's now peaking over here. So I've experienced experience a shift. What will happen is that as I start to monitor these points, I'm going to get a point here, here, I might find one there, here. I'm going to get a lot of my data points lying below the target line. So here's my original target line. I'm going to start to see this sort of behavior. My process is still within the control limits, still between upper and lower control limits, except I'm going to get sequences of data points which are all one side of the target. Instead of the usual, which you have points evenly distributed above and below the target. So when you have the shift in the process, you'll start to observe the process tracking more to one side than the other. And here are the rules of thumb. It says, raise an alarm if you see two out of three points lying beyond two sleep, or four out of five points lying beyond one sleep, or eight successive points on the same side of the center point. Every, any one of those additional rules will also raise an alarm. So you don't have to wait to see the point outside the limits. You can raise an alarm a little earlier if you start to see these very unusual events occurring. And these numbers, two out of three, four out of five, they're purely based on the risk of companies observing these events happen. So this will improve your detection ability as well. So another neat thing that you can go do is you can go add warning limits. So if your process starts to go to two sigma and beyond, but, so it's between two and three sigma, but not quite outside the limits yet. You can go turn the background of an orange color. So you're warning the operators, look, you're approaching this three sigma limit. Uh, companies will often turn that graph bright red if you're outside the limits to warn the operators. The other thing that's really nice is, remember I just described earlier that in phase one of your of your, of your monitoring, where you go calculate what those limits are, it's a very iterative approach. You build your limits, check if they are on the outside, exclude, rebuild, <coughs> Well, you can get by all of that iteration by simply using a robust method. So rather than calculate the means and the standard deviations, you can go use the medians and the mads, and you want to be effective by it. So you can get your limits in one go without an iterative procedure. So there, 600 level students, um, there's a journal reference in the, in the course notes that you can go read that as well. Now, <coughs> one final point before we look at some other control charts here, is let's take a look at what happens when you're monitoring correlated variables. This is, this is a critical point. Remember phase zero? What was phase zero? Phase one is where you build your monitoring chart, phase two is where you use it online, but phase zero, select your variables. And what was the guidance on selecting variables? Critical to quality variables. Now, companies have the following policy. When you're producing a final product that is important to your customer, you go measure as many things on that product as you can before you ship it to them. That's the general rule of thumb. You'd rather know everything about the product I'm shipping to my customer than just to measure one or two variables. What happens then in this age now of large amounts of data where you're measuring multiple things on the same sample is that you can pick two variables that are very correlated. It's going to happen quite easily. So let's take a look at this. Here's 50 samples of product that I've shipped to my customer. So I've gone to my database. And let's call these variables x1 and x2, my the polymer property 1, polymer property 2 that I've gone and measured on the past 50 batches of polymer. 
all of these observations for property one lie within the control limits, all the observations for property two lie within the control limits. So these are the three signal limits that you would have computed anyway. Anything you notice about property one and property two? Negatively correlated. How do you notice that? Okay, so you see this amongst the points. This one is up, the other is down. So x1 and x2, there's some relationship between x1 and x2. That when x1 is high, x2 tends to be low, and vice versa. So the, there's a relationship between these two variables. Now let's go take a look at this interesting plot. So here's my raw data for x1 and x2. They all fly within the individual control limits. So what I've gone and done is on this horizontal axis, I've gone and plotted x2. And flip x1 90 degrees and shove it up this way, and you get the joint probability for the joint plot of x1 and x2. So time series plot vertically, time series plot horizontally. And here I've got a scatter plot of x1 and x2, clearly showing that negative correlation between the two variables. Now, here's the problem. What do you notice about observation 10, the one with the green circle? So, so observation 10, Sean says both went down. So property 1 is low and property 2 is low for observation 10. You can see that on the individual curves. Property 1 is low for observation 10 and low for, observation, uh, for property 2. Thank you. Here we see this ellipse that I've drawn here. So I'm plotting x1 against x2. We see our scatter plot. All the other 49 <coughs> observations tend to form along a line there. They form that negative correlation line. This observation in green, very, very different from the other data. Okay, very clear that it stands out as being different from the other two, other than the other 49 observations. But individually, it falls within the control limits. This product, if you ship it to your customer, it's going to ruin their, their machine or it's going to produce products that they cannot use. They may not even be able to melt it in their extruder. Or it may create a product that has a very different color than what they normally produce it. This product has broken the usual relationship between X1 and X2. X1 and X2, the usual relationship is to move opposite each other, have a negative correlation. But observation 10 has low values of X1 and X2 that's broken that usual relationship. So this batch of material that you created as a random batch, very, very unusual. But you're not going to pick that up on the individual control charts. And that's where your companies fail. They think if I go put a control chart on every single variable in my process, I'm going to catch the problems. No, you won't. You'll catch extreme problems in X1. You'll catch extreme problems in X2. But these subtle relationships with X1 and X2 have some form of relationship, in this case a negative correlation. Even though both are individually within their control limits, jointly, this ellipse forms a control limit. This is the elliptical limit for x1 and x2 jointly. That green point far outside the ellipse. So from the joint probability distribution, it's a very different, different sample of material. Okay. So this is a topic we unfortunately don't cover in forces. We talk about it in the graduate course on latent variable methods. But it is important to be aware of that simply slapping control charts on every <coughs> single variable is not a guarantee to catch problems. There will be these very subtle problems that can and do show up between joint variables. Okay, so very important to, to understand. I'd like to then just talk a bit about uh, one of cumulative sum charts. So cumulative sum charts are a way to overcome the defect of the Shuar chart. The Shuar chart 
is intended to track location, or in other words, to track that you're on targets. But I just showed you a little earlier there that the shoe on chart actually does not do a very good job. <coughs> For a very small shift in your process, the shoe on chart will not, will not pick up pick up the problem. So what people have done is they've, they've overcome that defect by creating a different model. So if you have a process where you very much need to be on target, you should not use a shoe on chart. So a good example of that is if you're doing fast rotation and you need to bubble air into your, into your tank to float your minerals, you need your flotation to occur at just the right point. Too much air, you're going to start to bring up your undesirable gang and float that to the top. Too little air, and your valuable mineral is going to sink down and not be taken up to your drop. So there's a point where it's just right amount. Many processes operate in that manner, where you're kind of on that, you're walking on the edge of like a narrow cliff. You fall over the edge if you go to one way, and you fall over the edge if you go the other way. You just need to be on track. Those sensitive processes are where you use the QC chart. Let's take a look at what it does. The QC chart says I need to be at a certain target, T. What I'm going to do then is measure how far away I am from the target. And I'm going to accumulate my error as I proceed. So here's my target capital T that I need to be at. I take my raw data point x naught, it's over there, and I calculate this difference in height. And I call that S naught. This is x naught and this is S naught. Then I take my next data point. It's coming over here at the next time step, time step two, that's the value of x1 that I measure, and it's got a certain height away from my target. That height is S1. What a cumulative sum chart does is it monitors these heights and sums them up. So the first time I was in deviation by a small amount, at the next time point I had a lot of deviation. What the QSUM chart will show you is this deviation plus that deviation. Then at my next data point, x3, maybe I'm going to be this far away from target. Sorry, x2 in this. Uh, okay, so x0, x1, x4, x2. That's s2. I take that deviation and I sum it up with the previous two that I had up to now. So it's the cumulative sum of deviations x0 minus target, x1 minus target, plus x2 minus target. So it's a cumulative sum right from when you started the chart. So at some particular point you decide to turn on this chart, and what you're going to track then are these s values. You're not going to track your raw data x, you're going to track the cumulative sum of deviations. And now you can see quite clearly why this chart is so successful. Because a very small shift away from your target, you're going to start accumulating positive sums. For a process that's operating at target and has not shifted, you're sometimes going to sum a positive value, sometimes you're going to sum a negative value, a positive value, a positive value, a negative. It's all going to cancel out. Okay? If you're on target, this S is not going to grow overly large or overly big. It's going to wander up and down, but it's not going to go up and up and up and up. It's going to even out and cancel and stay at some average. Okay, so that's the, this is the formula for the QSIM chart. It's a recursive formula. So it's most easily expressed by saying my current point at plus is my previous point plus a deviation. And you just recurse through that formula. So let's take a look at how you use it. Here's a process that has, is, everything is quite okay. Nothing is shifted. Here's the raw data up in the top. No shift in the process whatsoever. All these points evenly distributed above and below. If I plot the cumulative sum, this is what it looks like. So my first deviation, I'm right at the target, I'm zero. Then I'm above, I'm going up a little bit, and I just keep wandering around. The fact that you trend away from zero is quite okay. okay? The cumulative sum will not hover around zero. Over the long term it will, but this plot will often travel up and then travel slowly down and keep wandering around. So obviously the question is, well, how do we know that a problem has occurred? How do you know when it is wandered off too far? 
Well, what we do is we don't actually monitor where this curve is. What we monitor instead is the slope of this curve. And that's what this V mask is. So we create a little mask, and my monitoring is how steep the angle of that V is. If I make my V very broad, a very broad V, I'm going to capture all my effect. If I use a very narrow V, I'm going to start to find the lines. So the fact that at this particular point in time, this arms of the V enclosed all the black ones means I'm okay. <coughs> Nothing has gone wrong. So as long as my V encloses the data, these S values, I'm okay. Let's take a look at what happens if a small shift occurs. Take a look at the plot now at the top of the board. So this is going to be important to see how subtle the fusion chart is. This is nothing that's wrong in the process. The next slide, there's a shift that's occurred. The shift is barely perceptible to the, to the human eye. The shift has occurred here at time 150. Okay, now let's take a look at what the QC chart looks like. Same wandering as before, this is the same data, so it's the same pattern. At this particular point in time, now I can see my V is here, and my black dots cross the blue marks. So I raise an alarm. When that occurs. And in fact, if, if this V mask was to be moved further back here in time, if those black lines would also cross. So it's consistently going to raise an alarm as long as that, that occurs. This V mask, the problem occurred at time 150. So there's my angle over there. If I shift that V mask to this position, my black points are still within the V. The alarm is only erased at this particular point in time. So it takes about 20, 30 samples before the alarm is raised. The problem occurred at 150, the alarm is caught at about 180. So it takes about 30 observations before it reached, it, it actually alarms. Before you've built up enough cumulative sums to say, hang on, the slope is rising steeper than it normally would have. Okay? So the monitoring limits for a QSIM chart, there are no upper and lower control limits. The monitoring limits for a, for a QSIM chart are the angle of the V. It's a very messy formula that's related to cosines and all sorts of geometry, geometrical mess. We leave the computers to figure out that. But that angle of the V and how far you extend the arms of the V are what you use to determine the control limits. Okay, so there the type 1 and type 2 error trade-offs can be set by the angle of the V and distance. We, we will never, I mean, previous courses would you teach we're going to the derivation of what theta the angle needs to be and how long those arms need to be. Let's not deal with that. The computers take care of that very successfully. Now, as an introduction to next class, I'm going to introduce another monitoring chart. So we've looked at two extremes right now. We've looked at, let's take a recap here, Schuart chart. The Schuart chart uses set of observations. So let's take five. N equals five. I take five data points for my process and calculate the average. Then I go another five data points and calculate the average. The, the second average I've calculated has no relationship to that first average. The next set of five data points I calculate, compute the average, no relationship to the prior two. What we say then is that the Schuart chart has no memory. The current data points on the Schumann chart is totally independent of the previous data points that have shown up in the Schumann chart. <coughs> a QSIM chart is totally the opposite, opposite, opposite of, of the Schumann chart. The QSIM chart has infinite memory. The Schumann chart is a recursive formula that keeps summing up and summing up and summing up all the way back to time zero. So your data point down here, all the way down, S5000, S whatever, in the future is definitely a function of S0, S1, S2, S3. So a QSIM chart has infinite memory all the way back to when you initiated the chart. Schuart chart, no memory whatsoever. Yeah, so a, Schuart, a QSIM chart you will typically reset if the event has occurred, you've gone and detected it, you say, okay, we sorted the problem out, let's restart it. You, or you can do it beforehand, but uh, like the, while the event is still occurring, you call it um, after you measure the current or is this going to be on Monday or is it 
No, as long as you're within the box, because it's the box angle that's the important part. So it really doesn't matter where you set it. In fact, I can re I can start my charts. I don't have to start at zero. I can start it anyway, because it's not the absolute height on the y-axis that's important. But that has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's totally the angle of that line that's that's going to be the absolute part. So Houston chart, I guess, you normally set it periodically, but um, and then most of the other patterns. <coughs> So I want you to have that in mind that the Shua chart has no memory, the Houston chart has infinite memory all the way back to time zero. Well, let's see if we can get some middle ground going, and that's what the moving average charts are about. So a moving average chart goes the following. It says, let's kind of smear, smear our memory a little bit. I take my data points here, and I calculate x bar 1. In Shua chart, we jumped all the way over and calculated the next x bar, and then we jumped all the way over and well, a moving average chart does that, kind of, but it doesn't jump quite as much. It only jumps by one tiny unit, still uses the same subgroup size, and calculates x bar. x3 then moves by one unit over and calculates x bar. So there is a relationship between x3 bar and x2 bar. But if I was using subgroups of size 5, there's not going to be any relationship between x bar 20 and x bar 1. And because they're so far apart in time. So there's some middle ground here with the moving average chart. So a moving average chart, we can, we can represent mathematically as follows. X bar at any time t is equal to the average of the samples in my subgroup. Well, what is the average? The average is where you sum up and divide by n. Let's take a look at that. Another way I can write that mathematically is to say, here's my raw data point divided by n plus my next raw data point divided by n. And so up to my n data point to divide by n. So I'm creating a weighted sum of n data points where my weight is 1 over n. So every data point has the same weight of 1 over n. So if I was 5 data points, that would be 0.2 multiplied by that raw data point. Plus 0.2 times the next raw data point. Plus, plus 0.2 so I've summed up over five data points. So a, weight, a moving average chart uses weights where every raw data point has the same weight, the same weight of one over n. What we're going to look at now in the next class is the exponentially weighted moving average, where I give exponentially declining weights to all the data. So this point over here, xt minus n, is further in the past than xt minus one. This is only one time step ago, this point over here is 5 or 6 or whatever n time steps ago. It makes intuitive sense that we should give more weight to the most recent data. So rather than giving equal weight of 1n, 1n, 1n to every point, I can say, let me give more here, slightly less, slightly less, and decline exponentially to almost essentially zero weight for the back time. So we're going to look at that derivation and then some. Because n always applies. N is whatever you choose to some extent.